We're delighted to have you all back to this our show, Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. And you watched this already the 324th time, if you watched all the episodes the first time. And we is us back, our mid-century modern architectural master taught us a term that I yet have to remember, but it's, it means the three at one strike. And that's how he calls us, which is uh, Richard Lowe, uh, Bandit uh, Kanigakon and Martin Despain. So we are back to go back into Queen Emma Gardens. And we promised everyone to take you inside. But we start outside and we're standing here in front of the building with uh, its engineer, Alfred Yee, who we introduced to you last time. So, uh, gentlemen, let's talk about this picture here in terms of the title that we put here. Address code, addressing code. So what do these two you know, uh, characters, uh, its engineer and the building have in common as far as what they wear? Let's talk about that. Richard, what do you think about what L wears and what the building wears that he created, the parts that he created? Let's think about that. I think it's entirely unique. I've never thought of it before. It has closed for a building, but the 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 close of that building, using that term, are because of of Allier's cleverness at using chunks of concrete to actually make something that that feels good, and that that raises the building up more rapidly than other. Then other buildings go up often. And uh, so that Queen Emma has a, a number of unique qualities that among them is that uh, it was designed by a team of people. And it, uh, I, have, I wrote a very, very long sentence, which I've been advised not to read, <laughs> although I've been dying to read it. Anyway. Oh, do it then, please. Please do it. Just, <laughs> just ignore what you're advised. <laughs> All right, I'll do that. I'm saying here that the, 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 I, I seldom use the word essence, but I, this slipped out of my mind, and I use it in this first sentence. So the essence of Queen Emma's Gardens is the combination of, of uh, artist that artist brings to central Honolulu and to the housing inventory of Honolulu, both because of its double uh, accomplishment. That is of, of, a, of a good, of a very good architecture, and very good site planning, both of which are attributable to the selection of architects and engineers, landscape architects, and interior designers, who had the ability required to to achieve the excellence excellence of of fine design in in their personal judgment in other words the mixture of their their cleverness as professionals and also their their personal judgments about architecture and interiors and so forth so it 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 really created one of the best housing projects in the United States. And uh, and the location on the edge of downtown Honolulu and the civic center of the state capitol, which was rather recently, in terms of the timing of, of this, uh, one, of the, one of the best, in my opinion, the best state capital 
designs in the world. Now, that's going a little far, perhaps, but uh, I think the state capital of Honolulu, which w it was very interesting in, in, in several ways. First of all, the location, the location of the of the capital was tremendously and widely argued. But among leaders in the islands, all of the islands, and and the and the the, the more developer world of of real estate agents and and developers. And uh, then the question is how do you uh, how do you go from from there to what we've got? Or more importantly, what does that have to do with Queen Emma Gardens? It's just that Queen Emma Gardens sits on an acre eight acre area that was at one time lousy housing. I don't like the word lousing. I was I usually look for a more attractive term than that, but at any rate, uh, it was a uh, it was an area designated by the redevelopment agency as needing to be torn down and something else put in its place. And so uh, that is really what happened. It was a marvelous building. And I say that not because I lived in it on two occasions, once with a several friends of mine who were in, active in the Navy, and once with my wife and first child. And it was it was excellent for for each of those groups. And uh, we could we could we could go into the slides a little bit that, that might explode this this point better. So I'll now let now let's do that. So glad you violated your your advisors, you know. This was oh, excellent. Good. And um I would say, you know, I uh, we to frame this in, in Germany we call you a Zeitzeuge, which is a really funky word, lots of sets, right? And meets contemporary witness. Just for the audience, well, you know, we see you now well aged, like you know, good wine. Um but we want to immerse ourselves back then. This was in the early 60s. You were in your mid-30s. Uh, and um, when we go back to the previous slide one more time, please, Michael, um, about what they wear. You know, it was very, uh, John F. Kennedy was going through Waikiki in his Lincoln Continental, as we were recalling, and he was more dressed, more formally. He had a jacket on, a dark jacket which is climatically not a good idea because it absorbs the heat. And here, El Yi is in the 60s, so you had to be formal with, with suit and tie and not like you, Bandit, you know, charmingly always want to do this project with a Hawaiian shirt with that line mark that, you know, depicts where it's usually tucked into the pants where it shouldn't be. And there's also no Hawaiian pattern on there, which is, is the thing, right? So... Um, and there, there is a criticism, um, uh, Richard, that, um, you know, um, people, let's not say Hawaiian, but basically local people were kind of almost overwhelmed by statehood and didn't have the chance to develop from one story buildings, you know, fetch huts to high rise concrete buildings. But L is actually a good exception to, the, to that rule because he's homegrown boy from there. And he, you know, uh, represents as the story who is going to pick up from what you just talked about, the Civic Center, pretty soon over a spring break in two weeks. He always says the best of both worlds. So there's, we see the American in there, you know, as the formal, you know, suit, uh, no suit, but tie. And, but we see the local as the short sleeve and we see no BS and we see no pattern and no Hawaiian shirt, right? And I think that's very much what, what the building is as well. And yeah, let's go to the next slide and now show the little sort of 
pieces of garment of clothing, you know, which make what you so perfectly said, Rich, which uh, makes you comfortable in the buildings. So which are these sort of devices that create this comfort? And, and you, Bunnett, you always point out because you're the prime scholar. This is from your website at the Shen Gallery and from the archives of the family. You say this is prefab. So which prefab element do we see here and what is that doing, Richard? Well, I, th I think the, the building is, is quite informal on the one hand and quite formal on the other. I know that's kind of a mix of ideas. But uh, it, it's a very modern, what I would call modern building, especially then. And there have been, there, housing was very big at some of the schools I went to, Cal Berkeley and MIT, and housing was a, a very big subject at the time. First of all, the, the lack of it. And, and second of all, the poverty of it. And so here we are with a combination of talents who are, who are really able to put together all the pieces and make it into a, a very comfortable environment. That's not to mention the site planning, that, which also with uh, under the direction of, of some of my professors, became a very important element of any design of, of anything. And the site planning of, at Queen Emma Gardens is particularly effective. And they were able to locate three large buildings, one parallel to the Pali Highway and quite big in its own right, and two others uh, on the other side of the, uh, uh, on the Nuanu side of the complex. And I think that it just, it turned out wonderfully well. The, the site plan, of course, has a lot of features that are, but traditional and and also uh, uh, new and and it really comes across as a park next to a park and next to other parks so it it's, the location of it was it was miraculous it was a large they needed an 8 acre site for producing the number of units they wanted to, uh, and uh, and so that that happened, and they have beautiful pools. Uh, traditionally, uh, Japanese-looking pools and gardens around them, as well as kind of cabin-like buildings that house things like weddings, perhaps the word funerals should be added, although I'm not sure of that, And uh, but a, a very attractive environment of, of buildings in the first place, and then linked together beautifully with walkways and, and uh, landscape galore. And there it was in the right next to the downtown, very, very close to the capital and all the state, federal, and city buildings of, of Honolulu. Yeah. And I think that the, the mixture of, of, of all those things was really kind of miraculous. I'll try not to use that word anymore because I've just used it twice. And the uh, the building emerged from really the hands of very, very good designer of large buildings. Right. 
Yeah, I can add something to it, Martin, um, if you don't mind. Do, do. Yeah, um, just to add on to Richard, um, this is the building that, you know, if you refer back to the dress code, um, it's the one that allow a lot of, you know, um, um, sun, uh, protect the sun from coming into the building. And this is what you see in the slide is the photo of the eyelid that um, help protect the sun um, to hitting inside the building to, just to keep it very comfortable inside. And it's all precast um, in couple A and um, they track it in. So just like LG shirt that, you know, it made somewhere, but he just ha happened to wear it, you know, with short sleeve. Um, I do wish though that he doesn't wear a tie. You know, and let loose. That's my two cents. But but these were these were again the sixties. So in all fairness, right? One one yeah. had to be very formal. But he's as hang loose, you know, as as he can under the given circumstances. And let's go yeah. to the next slide and show the other piece of the garment of the building that um, is so cool, literally and figuratively speaking. So what are we looking at here, Richard? Do you remember what these elements were and still are? Yeah, we're looking at a, a part of the window design wall of the, of the building. And to be frank with you, I can't remember exactly what that particular piece was doing on the building. Luckily, we have someone again who knows very well as the prime scholars. So, Banda, help us so out. That's that's the eyelid that, you know, cap um, the rooftop, you know, of the building. It's also precast. And um, like I said, it's it just cast in couple A and truck it in piece by piece. And it's also allow uh, people to go up on the roof uh, to do the maintenance and to do um, a proper um, waterproofing up there. And if you have anything to add, let me know. Yeah, I, I think these are also or they are alike. Um, these uh, closets that um, are stacked on, on each floor. And if we go back to the first slide, Michael, one more time, we see how like in garment where it's all sort of woven into each other. So we see the, the eyelid brows uh, in front of the living rooms. And then we see in front of the bedrooms uh, between the eyelids here, we see something that is very unique and we don't anymore unfortunately that is opacity meaning the absence of transparency because as you said so perfectly uh, you know richard especially you and i you know white skin howlies having have the same the certain dermatologist for that reason to always check on us you want to keep the sun out and away from the first skin our skin and the second skin that's Holding and the third skin, which is the um, uh, fenestration of building. So it does that um, by providing, you know, uh, um, opacity uh, through these prefab closets. And uh, it is double duty. So you already have your builds in, which is a very, um, again, uh, Asian tradition uh, that you bonded a very familiar and Alfred's, you know, ancestry is. And bring this in. And at the same time, it's keeping you cool. So another very clever device, climatic uh, control device as a passive system. And then uh, the most spectacular one is the next one. We go to the next slide. Well, slide four. We have to go back to slide. Now we go to slide four, Michael, exactly. So what in the world is that, uh, Richard? What are we looking at? Are we inside? Are we outside? Where are we? We're inside, and, and that particular space that we're looking at, I say space, even though one wall of it is missing, uh, because it, it added a, a, a highly mobile space that the people who bought in, in that part of the building, which was the Malka end of each of the towers, of, of two of the towers, the big towers, and so they were able to kind of live as though it's a lanai on the one hand and a room on the other. And I haven't exactly. Been, pardon me. No, go ahead. I haven't been in every apartment in the building. I've been in lots of them. And 
So I've, I've seen how what variety you can put to a space that's as simple as that one as a marvelous view looking down toward the Civic Center and in part the downtown. Yeah. And leaves it completely up to the owner. Yeah, and again, while L had the advantage to be a homegrown local boy, he knew that there is really no winter. But Yamasaki, as you pointed out, it's, you know, collaborating architect was from New York. You are, are, grew up in California, which is more moderate. But you also went to the Midwest, which we get to later, and you were in Chicago. So you know what temperate climate to its most extreme means. So doing something like this is truly tropical, exotic, why done, as you said, by this collaborative collaboration of, of these mid-century um, modern masters. And um, if you're wondering how this all comes together, then today, next slide, is what we were stealing from a realtor's website. You can actually see uh, in, the, in, in behind, you see that, um, which is the ultimate of Lanai, as uh, you, Rich, you called it last time so perfectly. It's way more than a balcony. I mean, it is bigger. It's actually a main room, right? Yes, it is. And so, um, but you also see in this contemporary that we don't quite live it up to how they uh, offered it to us because this is pretty much stuffed and there's this big sofa with its back sort of towards, which is back, back butt. Uh, it's facing towards that thing and there might be some furniture there. So again, I think we need to sort of, you know, raise sort of re-appreciation for what's provided there. And that gets us to the next slide, which when we were uh, yesterday at the Outrigger Canoe Club, as per your generous invite, Rich, as always, we were preparing here and you rightly so asked to put this in here because this shows where it all comes together. All the elements that we've been talking about, even sketched in that little eyelid that they, the realtor's website again forgot. You see the, the shading closets, you see the lanai, but you also see the other parts. And so, gentlemen, and especially you, Rich, as the prime Zeitzeuge, the contemporary witness, that's what it means in English, and having seen many units and, and lived in two, uh, explain, uh, share with us your experience what was so comfortable and cool, literally and figuratively speaking, and you know what what kind of clues can we take from this for the future of you know creating more of that? Because by the way, we are in a severe, if not the most severe, uh, sheltering and housing crisis. So, what can we learn from this for the future, Rich? I, I think you can learn that the the floor plan is is very very interesting to me and i think to others in that you enter a front door which is typical and it passes by a kitchen which is more or less typical but it is still it, it maintains the sort of wood look of of the building and then it gives over to a master bedroom, which is the big room on the left, and a smaller bedroom, which is the next bedroom, and then the, the lanai, which is on the right of the living room. And uh, it, it, one thing that's interesting to me is the lack, I say lack, not critically, but because it, it it didn't try to get all sort of fancy and, and large bathrooms, you know, with enormous showers and all that kind of thing. It kept it very simple. And these these units are are very, very simple. And they they were originally built to be rented by the company that built the of several buildings, and uh, I think they used great taste in in keeping them simple. And uh, yeah, so right. And on that note, if we can go back to slide four, because there were little numbers in there and little 
would you think you could basically snap um, a masterpiece by one of the most, if you go to Wikipedia, by the way, Yamasaki is mentioned next to Ed Stone as uh, the most prominent representatives of sort of a new formalism, they called it, go figure. But they were very prominent architects. So would you think you could find something, uh, a masterpiece of them on Craigslist? Yes, you can, where you usually buy used bicycles and whatever for cheap, right? This unit is for sale. I mean, that unit that has this room here is for sale, as you can see down there on Craigslist, and you see the price up there. So, Rich, while, yeah, it was sort of intended to be inclusive as rental, um, and now it falls back to the open market, which you're also very familiar with because one of your many talents and occupations has also been in real estate, just to mention on the side. So the price of this unit here is still pretty reasonable, right? So, you know, its intention of being affordable um, has been kept and has been maintained and retained even through the, the clause of predator capitalism, right? So they were successful. And, and one last thing, and then we're at the end of the show, but you really get me going and thinking a lot, which is the point of these shows, Rich. But, um, you know, Yamasaki had actually started out as even more um, social housing wise uh, with this one that I have to remember how to pronounce the name. You helped me out in St. Louis. That ended up a very tragic example for having failed. And it got torn down soon later in the early 70s. So this is actually really remarkable. This is one of the early works of Yamasaki and actually the first one in housing that actually was successful and continues to be successful. That's, that's pretty remarkable sort of in the oeuvre of, um, of that. So um, that being said, we need to continue next week. So we're going to be in our episode 325, and you're going to be the viewer and number that you see down there. So please keep watching us, keep supporting us. Push that donating button, because that's how we keep this here running. It's pro bono and nonprofit. And so going into more details next time, guys, is actually the kitchen, as you say, the kitchen is rather sort of, um, you didn't say conventional or sort of normal, but then let's pick up from there and say, and start out and saying within that, how is it also unusual and special and different? And that's going to be the kickoff of another exciting half hour with all of you guys together next week. And until then, please stay all as tropical exotic as L, Minoro, and you, Richard. See you next week. <laughs> now that that is a real compliment. Of course, these all of these units in the building were rented originally. Okay. Yeah, they were. I'm being notified. All right. Hmm? <laughs>